<laughs> Hi, John. How you doing? <laughs> this is a different way. It's normally you go up and stand at the podium. It's, this is just... I think that it's wonderful you're all here on time and we can start on time. I've been told that this microphone is a little fuzzy. If I sound bad, somebody just raise your hand and I'll move myself appropriately, I hope. Thank you, thank you. Um, welcome this evening. I'm Ruth Dinowitz, a member of the League of Women Voters of Albany County. Uh, we are one of the sponsoring members of tonight's forum. Um, the Spotlight is a co-sponsor, the Bethlehem Chamber of Commerce, and the Capital Area Council of Churches. For those of you who might not know what the League does, we are a nonpartisan volunteer organization. We do study different issues that we are faced as constituents, and another part, and the reason we're asked tonight, is that we do a lot of voter service. Uh, if those of you perhaps have not come to a candidate's night, there are a variety of formats that can be used. Uh, the candidates all tonight have signed off and have agreed upon what we're going to do. The evening will be divided into three separate parts. The first part we're going to have are the highway superintendents who are your candidates. Each will have an opportunity to make a three-minute statement. There are no questions or answers at this part. They will then leave and your four candidates that are vying for the town board will then come up. The format for that part is totally different. Each candidate will have an opportunity to make an opening statement and a closing statement. They have picked lots and they have determined the order in which they're going. As far as the questions go, um, they will be sitting at a table alphabetically. Uh, the first candidate will answer the first question first. By the time the second question comes, it will be the next one. So I will be rotating the order in which the candidates answer the questions. And another part of tonight's format, which isn't always at a meetings, is that each candidate uh, for the town board will have one opportunity to hold up a red card. And that red card will indicate that they would like to have one additional minute to expand on one question. The town board members can only use that once. After the time frame for that, we'll move to your supervisor candidates, where the format is quite similar, except they, I will rotate again. They have chosen the order in which they'll make opening closing statements. They, on the other hand, will have two opportunities to use red cards, and that will give them a chance to expand or re rebut something that's been said. Those of you who are sitting pretty close, their ladies in the front are our timekeepers. They are so important, otherwise the meeting cannot go on. They will alert me as well as the candidates as to how much time they're using. They will be alerted when there's 30 seconds left and when it's time to stop. And I look forward to tonight. I would just like to say that the league always has somebody moderating who comes from outside your jurisdiction. I am not a Bethlehem resident. I come from Colony. We hope to do this so that you recognize there is total neutrality uh, on the part of the moderator. So with that, I'd like to start. And the first candidate tonight is uh, Mr. Morin, who is chosen first to speak. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dan Morin. I am the Democratic can Party candidate for highway superintendent. I've worked for the department for the past 13 years. 
We all know the significant service problems that we've had in the department over the past four years. I know what the problems are. I know how to solve them. And with the help of the employees of the highway department, we will be able to fix this um, to help out the t town citizens, I'm sorry. Uh, it's been a difficult four years uh, for the town, uh, all of us who work at the highway department. Uh, it's been a dark cloud, it's been lifted. And all of us at the department look forward to rebuilding the trust and affection of the residents of the town. I hope to follow the example of Greg Sagendorf Sr. and with the help of the highway department employees, achieve excellence in the department again. I'd like to thank League of Women Voters, the Spotlight, and whoever else is <laughs> sponsoring us tonight. I didn't catch that. Thank you. There are many of us. Thank you. Um, Mr. Wagner, I believe you're the next. Okay. Uh, Giles Wagner, also a candidate for highway superintendent. Uh, I'm uh, got nominated from the Working Families Party line and also been endorsed by the Bethlehem, uh, Bethlehem Democratic Committee for the position. Uh, I'm honored that the Working Families Party line uh, nominated me. They have the same principles as uh, the Democratic Party has, jobs, environment, and uh, health care, and that type of stuff. As for me, born and raised in uh, Bethlehem, down in Selkirk, currently have a beef cattle farm there. Went to Ravina to high school. Uh, went on to uh, the College of Environmental Science and Forestry and got a bachelor's degree there and went in the military right out of, right out of college. Uh, 24 years of service, uh, retired as a uh, lieutenant colonel. We used to uh, deploy three air crew, three airplanes, 50 maintenance people to remote areas of the earth, Greenland ice cap, Antarctica and whatnot. And, uh, I was known as one of the guys that could get the job done, and also I was very good at getting people to do what they sometimes don't want to do. Uh, if it, uh, long history of uh, public service, uh, Selkirk Volunteer Fire Company since 1970, uh, commissioner for a five-year term there. I was a co-author of an agricultural and farmland protection plan, and also one of the new members of the Conservation Easement Review Board and currently serving on the town board. Uh, as far as the highway goes, uh, it's a very large and complex operation. It has 19% uh, of the, the budget for the town. That equates to about $7.9 million in 2018 for the highway. There's plus or minus a few, but 59 members, uh, 59 people that work there. Uh, they're mostly all dedicated, very hard working people. And uh, uh, they uh, service 175 miles of roadway and 40 miles of sidewalk. That's a lot of stuff. They do it with 25 dump trucks plus uh, leaf packers and uh, uh, bulldozers, uh, backhoes, ex excavators, and whatnot, all equipment that I've run. And besides that, they also service uh, the fleet of the, uh, the rest of the fleet of uh, the vehicles in, in the town through their maintenance facility there. In conclusion, uh, the town uh, the town's used to really good uh, highway services and uh, and how they're provided. Uh, and uh, if I was elected highway superintendent, I would do my best to. Uh, to ensure the citizens of the town continue to receive these good services. And, uh, uh, yeah, stop it says. And I hope I can <laughs> count on your vote November 7th. Thank you very much. I have to apologize before you speak. I neglected to remind you all to please silence your cell phones or do something with them. It's very difficult when people are talking, it intrudes. Mr. Zanstas. I would like to thank the League of Women Voters, the Spotlight Newspaper, Bethlehem Chamber, and the Cavalier Council of Churches for giving me the opportunity to speak to you this evening. I would also like to thank many town residents who took the time to come tonight to learn more about those who hope to represent you. For those of you who don't know me, I'm John Tiger Anastasi. I'm a life resident of the town of Bethlehem, and I'm running for highway superintendent. Who is the highway superintendent? Well. I am the guy who will keep your streets and sidewalks clear of snow and ice. I'm the guy who will keep your roads pothole free. 
I am the guy who will keep your parks mowed and ensure your leaves are picked up in a timely fashion. And I am the guy who will be out there in the middle of the night to make sure town roads are safe for you, me, and our children. Why am I running? Well, this is my town. I lived here my whole life. I've seen many changes, some good, some bad. I've seen services diminish due to mismanagement. I have also seen the frustration of the workers in this town who want the best for it, but haven't been given the leadership or resources to make it happen. Once elected, I will ensure a scheduled leave pickup in a timely manner, ensure effective paving and maintenance of our roadways, provide more accountability and responsiveness to resident issues, reevaluate town roadways and sidewalk conditions to maximize pedestrian safety. Limit taxpayer expenses by utilizing current highway employees for town projects and ensure our highway employees are cross-trained so we will have minimal downtime. First, I have run my own business for 35 years. I have, I have supervised a very large workforce. I have designed and built roads. I have put infrastructures in, including sewer, water, and drainage. I have built custom homes and commercial buildings. I have operated heavy equipment and vehicles since the age of 15. I designed projects and brought them in on time. I have created budgets and kept within them. I was raised with old school values where hard work and determination get the job done. With that being said, let me leave this to you. To the hard working employees of the highway department, I make you this promise. Someday soon, you will be proud of the department you work in and you will enjoy getting up and going to work again. It is my belief that if you have the confidence in your boss and, ha and the boss has confidence in you, you can work through any issue, big or small. Where there is unity, there is strength, and with division, there is weakness. And to the residents of the town of Bethlehem, it is more important for my opponents to tell you what party they represent than who they are and what they represent. I promise to work for you with no political labels. The only label I want to carry and will carry is highway superintendent. That's why I'm the right guy for the job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, I'm going to try. Mm -hmm. Alphabetical, I guess. Yeah. We just have two red cards. We have one card. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I think since the candidates are ready to chat, maybe I can ask the rest of you to stop. The order uh, that was picked by drawing of straws for the opening statements, Mr. Harder, we'd like to hear from you first, please. Uh, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is George Harder, and I am one of two Democratic nominees for the Town Council. I represent all wings of the Democratic Party, and I am an endorsed Independence Party candidate. I will serve people of all political affiliations and those not affiliated with a political party. My chief concern is the excessive and poorly planned development projects, both commercial and residential, which are rapidly transforming Bethlehem into a 21st century dystopian community devoid of the rural suburban charm which has always characterized the town. Both of my working families party opponents stand for a continuation of the failed working families party policies of the current administration which have, for six long years, promoted rampant overdevelopment, 
that disregard zoning restrictions, aesthetic considerations, and neighborhood character, imposed unfair tax burdens on undeveloped and agricultural lands, and given a green light to our now runaway planning and zoning boards. If you're fed up with the steady and quite obvious erosion of the quality of life in Bethlehem, try harder for change. I wish to thank the Bethlehem Chamber of Commerce, the Capital Area Council of Churches, the League of Women Voters, and the Spotlight News for giving me the opportunity to participate in tonight's candidate forum. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Cunningham, please. Good evening. This is what democracy looks like. So thank you all for being here. It's so important. I am truly honored and even humbled to be here tonight and to be running for Bethlehem Town Board. We're all here tonight because we care about this town deeply and we all want to ensure that it remains a safe, healthy, thriving place to live, to work, to run a business, to go to school, and to raise a family. Some of us are doing all of that. What I can offer to the town is this. I have a solid record over 20 years of academic and professional work and, and volunteerism. Much of it has focused on communities, including this one, um, and focused on helping those communities resolve complicated issues. I'm currently working to help protect clean water in the Hudson Valley and building the resilience of communities like Bethlehem to future threats like flooding and drought. As a nonprofit leader, I wear many hats, from building partnerships and, and facilitating community meetings to managing budgets and raising money. I currently manage a board, and I spend much of my time thinking and working and enhancing board governance. I believe in that so much change and positive change, especially now, can happen at the local level. And for this reason, not only I'm running, but I'm also a volunteer in, in many areas on community issues related to education, open space protection, bike and pedestrian safety, and planning for the future. My husband Paul and I are raising our two sons here in Bethlehem, and we believe in the quality of life and the strong sense of community we have. Throughout my career, I've treated people of all backgrounds with dignity and respect. I've collaborated and focused on teamwork, and I've poured everything I have into everything I do. And I'll do the same for the town of Bethlehem if you elect me to the town board. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Foster, please. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Jim Foster, and I would like to thank the Spotlight, the Bethlehem Chamber of Commerce, the League of Women Voters, and the Capital Area Council of Churches for sponsoring tonight's forum. Forums such as these are critically important to let the residents learn more about the candidates and what we stand for. For those of you that don't already know me, my family has a long history here in Bethlehem. I'm a third generation Bethlehem resident and have been a volunteer firefighter with Ellesmere since 2001. I attended Ellesmere Elementary where I had the pleasure of teaching fire prevention to hundreds of students earlier this week. And I graduated from Bethlehem Central High School. I also went on to graduate with honors from Georgetown University and Albany Law School and have worked as a senior auditor for numerous federal agencies including the Department of Defense and the Federal Housing Authority. I held a top secret security clearance and performed audit work at the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi, Kenya. Following law school, I took a position as an, audit, as an attorney at a top international law firm where I oversaw a team of over 60 attorneys in an international investigation into the global financial markets. During that time, I also provided pro bono legal counsel and advice to the Environmental Defense Fund. In 2016, I joined the corporate and transactional group of a local law firm in downtown Albany, and I recently purchased a home in Del Mar in the same neighborhood I grew up in. I am running for the position on the town board to preserve the character of our community and fight intolerance. The intolerance I speak of is a growing movement which is intolerant of opposing views or differing ideas. For many, the town board has seemingly become a monolithic entity that both thinks and acts as one, with no tolerance for ideas that differ from a narrow set of political views. This is not reflective or representative of a larger community. In fact, I have talked to so many residents who are disillusioned and dissatisfied with the direction our town is taking. We can and must do better. We need to restore balance to the town board so that every resident's voice is heard. We need to protect and preserve the character of our neighborhoods for future generations. I am confident that, if given this chance, we can work together to accomplish these things and so many more. 
Thank you. Okay. And Mr. No, I would like, this is a debate and a candidate's forum. It is not a political rally. I ask you to hold your applause till everybody is completed speaking as a courtesy. And Mr. Coffey, please. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank our moderator, Ruth Dinowitz. I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Spotlight, League of Women Voters, Capital Area Council of Churches, and our local Chamber of Commerce. I also want to thank uh, George, Jim, and Maureen, and all of you for coming here. Uh, this is great that we um, have a chance to sit down in a civil and a mature manner and talk about the issues of concern to you. I've been going door to door, hitting hundreds of homes. The biggest issues that I'm hearing about from residents are the need to better control the development that's been going on on town. Uh, and related to that, the issue of open space preservation and the, the need that if we don't preserve open space, uh, eventually we're not gonna have it and we're gonna turn into uh, just more urban sprawl and be more like Colony. Um, I'm hearing uh, excitement from people about the infrastructure that's being done, the work being done on Delaware Avenue, the new sidewalks that have been added in on uh, Fernbank and in North Bethlehem um, and also on Farrowbush and the need to connect more neighborhoods is something uh, that is of great concern to you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dan Coffey. My family has lived in central uh, Del Mar uh, since 1999 and my two uh, daughters went to um, Bethlehem uh, schools. Um, I am an attorney with 27 years experience. I manage a small law firm in Albany that deals with land use, environmental, and um, insurance litigation. Last year, I was honored to serve as president of the 1300 member Albany County Bar Association, where we dealt with very complex um, uh, fiscal deficit and budget issues. Um, at nighttime, I served as your zoning board chair at this table. I served under three different supervisors. I also served on the planning board. Given my background with budgetary issues as an attorney, as a volunteer in your community, I feel I'm well served uh, to serve as your town board member. As some of you have heard, I'm not going to be on the A line, I'm gonna be on row E, uh, but I'm confident at the end of the day when you cast your vote on November 7th, you're gonna vote for the best qualified person. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this part of the evening is about an hour. I have some, a lot of questions and I think we'll start right away. And Mr. Coffey, you will be the responder initially. The first question says, what value do you see in shared services? And do you have specific ideas where meaningful savings can be achieved? Thank you. Shared services is very, very important. It's something um, that um, the current town board has been working on and more needs to be done on that. Under state legislation passed this year, um, counties were encouraged to come up with a plan and Bethlehem was an active participant in that. Shared services such as EMT and, and uh, ambulance services have been done. There's a workforce database for shared employees. Uh, Bethlehem saved $2 million by combining highway parks, maintenance, restructuring, tax collections, and consolidating ambulance districts. Uh, but there's more that can be done in terms of sharing um, uh, our equipment with uh, neighboring municipalities so that we're not all out going buying the same equipment. There's no reason why we can't share it. Um, Bethlehem also, as part of shared services, um, converted lights to more energy, saved 35% on that. Um, so a lot's been done, but a lot needs to be done in terms of communicating with our neighbors and with Albany County on different levels to see where we can save taxpayers money by sharing services. Okay. Ms. Cunningham, could you respond? Uh, maintaining and ensuring our fiscal uh, responsibility and fiscal sound fiscal management are important to me and I think sh sharing services with other communities is extremely important I already sat down with Steve Kroll of the EMT services to find out how their the shared service with uh, the EMT in Albany County is working to see if it can be extended into other areas uh, I believe uh, County Executive uh, Daniel McCoy is working on a countywide plan for shared services. So I, as a town board member, I would reach out to Dan McCoy to see what uh, services Albany County is working on. I believe there was a report that came out last week that said Albany County is fourth um, in the state in, in the efficiency of shared service. So I think as the town, we need to build on that and see what other communities are doing and where we can work together. Thank Sorry. you. Mr. Foster, please. Certainly. Uh, I certainly see the value in shared services. Obviously, we're always striving for ways that we can be more efficient in what we do and that we aren't 
uh, redundant and that we are uh, collaborating with adjacent communities, both uh, uh, our immediate neighbors and throughout Albany County, so that we are accomplishing the most with the least. Um, with that being said, I also have concerns, however, in what we've seen previously. I have experienced both uh, as an employee in the town of Bethlehem's Highway Department and in Parks and Recreation, um, and I maintain a lot of friends in both departments. And um, it hasn't been a flawless transition in which we've combined those services. Um, so while prudent to look at and explore these options, uh, especially on an ongoing basis and a going forward basis, we also need to be reflective and understand where it doesn't work. Um, and I think also we're looking at a situation uh, recently proposed about combining uh, emergency medical services with the town of Voorheesville, um, our neighbor there. Again, uh, having uh, extensive experience in uh, the emergency services, I have concerns that we might have some gaps there, so. And Mr. Harder, could you address the question, please? I see some value in shared services, such as emergency services between towns. I feel, though, that we should not be spending our tax dollars on other, service, other services with other towns, such as highway department. Our tax dollars belong in the services that this town provides. So I would be careful in how we go about this process. I, I think there is some value, but there is also a waste of our taxpayer money involved. Okay. The second question, Ms. Cunningham, I'm going to begin with you on the second question. Uh, much has been said about open space preservation. What can be done with or without a real estate transfer tax? There's still an opportunity to set up a community preservation fund. It does not have to rely on, on any kind of tax. Um, if we set up a community trans, uh, preservation fund, it could be funded with private donations, uh, grant opportunities, and, and other kind of means. It doesn't have to de de depend on a tax, which would go to a voter referendum anyway. Um, I believe with our open space approach that we need to have a toolbox of tools. We can't just rely on one tool. Our conservation easement exe exemption program is one tool to uh, reduce taxes for landowners who opt into the program. Uh, we need more tools like that and more options for landowners who, who may want to sell their land. Thank you. And Mr. Foster. Certainly. I, I think my chief concern here is that the lack of creativity I saw in preserving open space it seemed to be the first inclination of the board was to reach out to Pat Fahey and, and uh, Senator Breslin in an initiative to propose uh, another taxing vehicle. That seems like a, an unelegant and simple, simplistic solution to a complex problem. Uh, I would much prefer to see us leverage the considerable generosity in private resources um, and quite frankly uh, the huge hearts of this community. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to sit on the advisory council of the Bethlehem YMCA and see uh, the incredible outpouring of support in causes that this community believes in. And I think we would see it here as well. People are passionate about preserving open space. It doesn't need to be imposed upon them with levying another tax. Um, let's look to private philanthropic endeavors. Uh, I've also seen examples where the communities have held art auctions where they uh, go into a 50-50 split where the, the artists donate 50% of the proceeds. Um, often these auctions are held at small barns or other similar spaces that are appropriate and the proceeds go, go to open space preservation. Okay. And Mr. Harder, please. I vehemently oppose the real estate transfer fee. It's only another slush fund for government to use in any way they wish. I think a better approach would be to have local legislation to prohibit the revaluation of undeveloped land and agricultural land. That way the owners would know for the lifetime of how, however long they own the property what they would be paying in taxes and that would induce them to preserve the open space and the green space rather than selling their property to developers. Okay. And Mr. Coffey, please. Thank you. Um, there are several tools that we need to use uh, for open space preservation. We have the conservation easement um, the county just bought into it. We need to get um, all the school districts um, to uh, to buy into it so it'll make it more feasible. Um, 
we have to explore different uh, ways to fund it. We do need to fund. It's something that was in the comprehensive plan in 2005 and something that we've fallen behind on. We really need to get forward with finding the funding for it. There's different mechanisms. Private donations have been suggested, state and federal grants, parkland set-aside funds. Also, uh, to the extent that there is a transfer tax, we do not have to go to 2%. The town of Warwick in Orange County has a 0.75% transfer tax. Um, and um, so we can use different ways to fund it, but let's get going on it. Let's get the fund so that we can get out there and stop things like clanky farms. We can actually get out and buy up property the way that uh, Clifton Park just purchased 34 acres using a million dollars. That's something we need to be able to do. Okay. Yes, you would like to use your time. Go ahead. Uh, I serve on the Conservation Easement Review Board. Uh, I've served on it uh, for about a year. I've been working on open space in committees um, for the town for several years. I do take issue that we're not being creative because I'm extremely proud of the conservation, conservation easement exemption program that we have. Only one, we're only one of a handful of communities that even have this throughout the whole state. I presented on it at a workshop last year because there aren't that many tools available to protect open space. So that was being very innovative and creative. And I think um, for landowners that opt in, it's a great tool. Um, the, cons the community um, preservation fund is also something that not all communities are using, but it is an important fund that, that is thinking out of the box. Um, if we rely on private donations, then why isn't the Kleinke's GoFundMe page working? Um, because people have not been donating. Um, so I would like to talk to Ryan about how to, to get more funds into that. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will begin with you, Mr. Foster. Uh, hate speech is dividing us at a national level. Do you see this as an issue in Bethlehem? Uh, so I, I certainly understand and appreciate concern in that regard. Um, as, a, as a legal scholar, I'll, I'll tell you that uh, hate speech is not a recognized legal term. Uh, it does not exist under our, uh, our code of laws. But with that being said, I have profound respect for every individual, regardless of creed, background, religion, whatever it may be, but I have equal respect for the First Amendment. And as unfortunate as it may be, there are individuals that exercise that right in ways that we might find personally reprehensible and despicable. However, the fact remains a guiding principle under our Constitution is that individuals have the ability to say some very repugnant things. And does that mean that it might bleed over and actually find a place here in Bethlehem? I'm afraid that might be the truth. However, I always expect that Bethlehem is also going to be a bastion in which we respect and honor the Constitution, in particular the First Amendment. Mr. Harder, please. I agree that the First Amendment gives us the right to say what we want. I, I don't think hateful speech is appropriate, but it is still something that is allowed by the First Amendment. I don't think that uh, hate speech is a huge problem in Bethlehem. I do think that there are people who disagree vehemently with others and what they say, but I, at the same time, I respect people's opinions. I respect the differences in people's thought processes, and I think preservation is free speech is vitally important. Mr. Coffey, please. Uh, I, too, am a strong advocate of the First Amendment. Uh, I, I very, very strongly believe that you have the right to um, express your beliefs, whether it's kneeling during the national anthem or saying something um, that expresses your feelings. There is a line, however, where it does turn into hate speech, as we saw in Charlottesville. And I think when something incites violence, I think you cannot stay quietly and allow it to go, by, go on. You have to stand up and speak against hate violence, hate uh, speech when it occurs. Uh, the people of Bethlehem have been terrific as I'm walking door to door. What I f find, though, is there's more cyberbullying going on, if that's hate speech. You see comments made on Facebook and other uh, social media against candidates which cross the line, which you would never say to somebody's speech. So I think as long as we keep in mind, don't say something in social media that you wouldn't say to somebody's face. Hopefully we can uh, obviate some of that. Okay. And Ms. Cunningham, please. I, too, believe in the First Amendment. Uh, I also believe that to be patriotic, to be a true American, you also should be compassionate 
you, know, you should try to lift up and protect vulnerable people. And I believe that starts at the local level. I do think people use social media and even cars to do things they wouldn't normally do face to face. So if we can encourage more face to face communication in this town, more meetings like this where we're meeting each other and talking to each other, um, I think the police can do a great job and I've talked to uh, Gina Kachara about police education um, in this issue and diversity training. Um, and I think we are building a community room um, as we speak or it's in the works and I think again more communication and interaction between people is how we get past this issue. Thank you. I always know when I'm in a community that isn't mine because there's a word on this question that I don't understand, <laughs> but I'm sure everybody else will. So, Mr. Harder, here's, here's a question. Do you support the Delaware Avenue Road something? Is it diet? Okay, uh, it says diet? Okay, I did not know. Okay. Ms. Okay, now I understand it. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Harder, you have the uh, first opportunity to respond. The Delaware Avenue Road Diet is, could be a very uh, burdensome thing for commuters, especially at rush hours, if uh, the plan for one lane in each direction with a center turning lane goes through, I foresee major traffic backups at certain points along Delaware Avenue, especially during rush hours. Uh, it certainly wouldn't be a problem during most of the day, uh, but I also see that uh, the possibility of head-on collisions in that center turning lane from frantically driving drivers. Mr. Coffey, please. Um, I went to the presentation a week or two ago where, on the road diet. I think it's an interesting concept. I think it's something we need to think more about, have more public hearings on. I am leaning towards supporting it. Uh, the idea is to shrink the road from the CBS down to the Norman Skill. Um, there's, there's, I think, five different options for doing it. Um, it's, the City of Albany did it on Madison Avenue. I understand there's been some success to it. The idea is to have a turning lane in the middle and then have one lane. If you go with what the, what's called the full diet, would be to shrink it down. Uh, I do have concerns what that's going to do for um, the, oh, that's okay. for the um, for the commuting times coming down Delaware Avenue, particularly during rush hour. Um, my understanding from the data is they, they did five trips back and forth Delaware. I think we need to do a little more uh, data collection to see what the overall impact would be on commuter traffic. Ms. Cunningham, please. I do support what I know of the road diet. Uh, I, I, as I understand it from Rob Leslie and others that were at the meeting that night, it may not happen for five more years when the DOT decides to pave the road. So I think we have ample time to research um, and understand the issue more. Uh, I, I served on the bike and pedestrian committee in town. It's one of the most passionate and hardworking uh, committees we have in town. Uh, and I do believe that we need to um, enhance our safety, accessibility, and con connectivity in town. Um, and we need to make our, tr our streets safer. Um, I have two kids uh, who ride and bike down to Hammer Grill every day and the middle school now. Um, and I believe that we need to not only educate our children um, about safety, um, but we also need, as responsible drivers and adults, create the, the mechanisms for that safety to happen. Um, I'm going to end there because my time is going to run out. <laughs> and Mr. Foster, please. You know, certainly this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. I grew up and now live behind Ellesmere School. Um, that's in my response district with the Ellesmere Fire Department. I've been to several accidents actually recently uh, in that corridor that's under consideration. Um, with that being said, I'm also a firm believer in statistics and reports and analysis. Uh, to Dan's point, I don't think, for example, five trips rise to the level of statistical significance that gives me any great assurance that there won't be a material impact on commute times. Um, this is further borne out by the fact that the uh, Michigan Department of Transportation did a study in 2012 that found that in areas in which there is excess of 10,000 vehicle trips daily, uh, when they go down from four lanes down to three, as is proposed in many of the uh, scenarios here, there are significant delays incurred. 
um, just by way of comparison. Currently, there are 18,300 daily trips in that corridor. Um, so nearly double the threshold that the uh, Michigan DOT uh, spoke about. And you know, I think we need to look critically if we're going to implement this because uh, this would have a huge impact on a lot of computers and local businesses in that corridor. The next question, Mr. Coffey, I'm going to begin with you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Did I miss someone? Did you get this? No. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so oh, I'm sorry. Did you throw hold? I did, yeah. I, so. Where is it? Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. I apologize. It, it, was, it was sheepishly raised. I apologize. Sheep, well, then hold it up proudly. Okay, so. Okay. <laughs> um, All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> as a former soccer player, I had an aversion to the red card. But, uh, ah, yes, the red card. So, yes. Um, <laughs> Well, thank you for the opportunity for the additional minute. Um, you, you know, I, I think another important fact is that there, the studies up to this point have looked at the number of incidents on that corridor, and in the five years for which there's available data, which I believe to be 2010 through 2015, there were 213 accidents, fortunately no fatalities, um, but I believe a couple dozen injury, uh, personal injury accidents. Again, I'm familiar with some of those myself. Um, but only seven of those involved bicycles and only two involved pedestrians. I think that's significant and tells us how that corridor is predominantly used, especially in light of the 18,300 average vehicle trips that take place during that, in that corridor. Of the seven bike accidents that did occur, only three occurred on the roadway. The other four took place on the sidewalk, um, which uh, we know is not good bicycle riding etiquette or practice, but uh, the, the facts are the facts. Um, and one of the three cyclists that was on the roadway was riding the wrong way. So that leaves two accidents in five years that involve cyclists exercising and riding with the flow of traffic. So then these are factors we need to look at. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't see that. Okay, Mr. Coffey, the next question I will begin with you. How would you suggest building stronger partnerships with the business community? Um, Certainly we need, one of the goals of the comprehensive plan was talking about diversifying our uh, tax base and doing more to attract business. Um, we see the Vista Tech Park has, has been there for several administrations, has not taken off. So we need to either bring in the tech, which we keep hearing from Monolith that they're trying to get the funding and, and that's not coming through. We either need to, to start the tech in there or we need to repurpose it and just make it a general uh, shopping center. So at least we can get some tenants in there and get some tax, uh, tax base. Um, the lakefront uh, water, uh, local waterfront redevelopment plan is meeting on October 24th. They're going to talk about uh, the nine miles of town which uh, borders the Hudson River and what can we do down there in terms of uh, not only recreational activities but also business development. Also, I'd like to look more at the uh, Selkirk Bypass plan where, which would divert truck traffic from exit 22 over to the more heavy industrial areas of town. Thank you. Ms. Cunningham, please. Thank you. I, we, as Dan mentioned, the VISTA project has some industrial and retail space available. Um, we also have a um, similar issue in South Bethlehem. As a town board member, I would like to reach out and work with the IDA and the town supervisor to maybe be uh, aggressive about trying to attract businesses and industry into this area. We have a great community and great services, and I believe we can um, get uh, industry in Bethlehem in those places. Um, I also am a strong believer in our local businesses, and I have to say this. Um, we have a great local, um, local business owners. We have farm stands. We have a lot that we can celebrate and support right here in town. Um, and I think as more um, industries come to Bethlehem or could come to Bethlehem, it also is more people grabbing lunch in, in Old Del Mar in the Four Corners area. And I think we, need, as citizens, need to support these businesses as much as possible. Thank you. Mr. Foster, please. Sir, certainly. I'm fortunate enough that in my private practice, I work with a number of small businesses, uh, whether it be from formation of, uh, of their business incorporating or for forming their LLC, um, or working with IDAs, um, signing commercial leases, all these things that we work on with local businesses and small businesses. Um, and time and time again, what I see as a deciding factor as to where these businesses are arriving is bottom line dollars and cents. Uh, where does it make sense for them to establish themselves and, and grow and build a business? And quite often I think that we're seeing that we're losing out to communities like Saratoga that uh, have, you know, for various reasons are much more attractive to, to business startups. Um, and, and we need to work 
collaboratively with uh, small businesses to make sure that we are a pro-business, business-friendly environment. Uh, I've spoken to personal uh, owners here that say there are impediments to just about everything they want to do, whether it be lighting on the front of their structures um, or little things here and there that ultimately add up to death by a million paper cuts to a business. We have to take away some of those impediments. And Mr. Harder, could you respond, please? Well, one thing we can do for business is finally get the Selkirk bypass built so that trucking companies can have an easier, more efficient way of traversing between the thruway and, and the town. Uh, I think wh when and if we do bring in business to the town, we should not give away taxes. We should collect tax from the businesses. Payment in lieu of taxes is not a good thing for the town. Uh, you lose tax revenue that way. When the business uh, contract is up for the payment in lieu of taxes, they oftentimes move out of town. Uh, we can certainly do better with the IDA advertising and pushing and and uh, promoting our town to bring business in. Okay. Thank you. The next question, I'll start with you, Ms. Cunningham. Uh, do you think it's good or bad to have a town board comprised entirely of a single political party? Explain why you feel this way. Good question. Uh, I believe in democracy. Uh, I. I, I'm not kidding when I say that. I think it's important that we elect people. I think um, our town is changing, and I think it's quite possible that we'll have one party or three in one, and I think that is, is the way democracy works. And hopefully, if people do a good job, they'll get reelected, but if they don't, you have the opportunity as voters to vote them out. So uh, again, I will repeat what um, someone said earlier that, you know, if I was elected to t town board, I would try to represent all residents and listen to all residents. I think it's a small enough town that political parties shouldn't matter at the town board level and we should all work together and collaborate. It's a town, it's a board of four people. So I would reach across to the next person, um, no matter what their political party. So I think we need to get past that and, and focus on collaboration. And Mr. Foster, please. I agree with Maureen that we need to get past political party. And I would encourage everyone sitting at this table, including uh, as well as current sitting town board members, to get past political party as well and make sure that we're always advocating for and representing every citizen and every resident of Bethlehem, regardless of political affiliation. Um, unfortunately, again, having seen it firsthand, in which I lost a very tight race by only about 10 votes out of over 10,000 cast, I've talked to a lot of people that feel disillusioned and unrepresented uh, for the past two years and quite frankly for a lot longer. Um, they look to a purely democratic board and they see that their viewpoints are often either not seriously entertained or uh, they walk away from town meetings feeling like they don't have a voice. And I can't think of a single less democratic feeling and sentiment to have than feeling like you don't have a voice and that your opinion doesn't matter, whatever it may be and whatever political party you may belong to. If I'm on the town board, you'll always have a voice, regardless of the political party, and you always have your voice with me. And Mr. Harder, please. A single party controlling the town board is usually inevitable over time. One political party or the other will take control mostly due to population of a town. Uh, the, the fact, though, is that diversity is probably a much better thing for the town. Several different viewpoints are better than one controlling viewpoint. I, as a town board member, would certainly represent all people of all political affiliations, and that is just the way I am. Mr. Coffey, please. Um, I believe it or not, I have friends who are Republicans, and uh, I'm in a unique situation of being the Democratic-supported candidate on the Working Family Party line. So to, to answer your question, if I get elected, I'm not sure we're going to all be in the same party. But in any event, I'm running to represent all the residents. 
As the zoning board chairman, I always solicited all points of view from all, all people who had different perspectives. And as I always told, always told the zoning board, we're not always going to agree. And if we have a 3-2 vote, that's fine. That's why we have a board of five people, because we're going to have a diversity of opinion. Um, if I'm fortunate to get elected, uh, I would serve on the board with uh, Joyce Becker. And if, uh, let's say, David and Maureen get elected, yes, we would be Democrats. But we would all be coming to the job with different backgrounds. I'm a small business owner and attorney. Maureen runs a small uh, nonprofit, and uh, David Van Leuven runs his consulting business. So the, the key is to uh, elect people who have a diversity of background who can bring different skill sets to the table and not focus on party affiliation. Okay. Uh, the next question I'll begin with you, Mr. Foster. Are you willing to open discussion with the planning department to develop zoning laws to preserve historic districts like Slingerlands? I think we always need to look at, uh, on an ongoing basis, uh, the zoning that we have here in the town of Bethlehem. And I think this goes to a discussion that we hear time and time again happening at doorsteps. I think all of us can agree that a chief concern of the residents is, are we maintaining our community and the characters of our neighborhoods and communities? And to make sure that we're effectuating that, maybe we need to look at the comprehensive plan and you know how different zoning is proposed there and make some amendments and tweaks to it. Because I think a lot of folks are looking back and saying that the Hamlet districts, for example, the Hamlet zoning is maybe not working out or uh, working in the manner, manner in which we had thought it would be. Our communities are changing in ways that we didn't anticipate or didn't see coming, and we're not always happy about it. So we need to look at our full quiver of, uh, of arrows and see what we have in our, our, our bag of tricks. And I think that needs to include uh, historic districts and, and looking at what we can do in terms of zoning uh, amendments there, too. Thank you. Mr. Harder. Historic pr district preservation is extremely important for a community. It defines the character of a community, and it uh, gives the community a feeling of pride in what we have. Unfortunately, there are no regulations right now concerning historic preservation. So the residents of the area, the owners of properties, would have to decide whether they want regulation or don't want regulation. And if they do, then zoning would, ordinances would change, the comprehensive plan would change, but that would all have to be a collaborative discussion with the residents of the particular areas. Okay. And Mr. Coffey, please. Um, having served on the zoning board for, for over seven years and on the planning board, I, I do think it's time to take a hard look at the zoning code. We have 16 different zoning districts now. The comp plan has been reviewed. I, I served on the comprehensive plan assessment uh, committee a couple of years ago. Um, but we need to make sure that the characters of the neighborhood as reflected on the zoning map are accurate uh, given our changing community. Um, we need open space fun if we're going to preserve historic parts of town like, like portions of Slingerlands and I understand the concerns over uh, near near Manja and the cemetery nearby we need to have um, uh, another tool in our quiver would be an open space preservation fund the town has been developing an open space values map and they had a presentation the other day at Five Rivers that I attended one of the one of the values that they're looking at is his, his historical um, significance so if a piece of land has historical significance it should be something we could use our tools to try to to preserve that land either by purchasing it outright or pur purchasing uh, development rights to make sure that the parcels are preserved. Okay. And Ms. Cunningham, please. I believe uh, community character and history are, are critically important in anything we do and any new plans. Uh, I would be in favor of taking another look at the com comprehensive plan. It's been reviewed twice, but I think it should be a living document. I think uh, we need to review the priorities. Many of them have already been done, including the um, waterfront revitalization plan. Um, I think we need to set a new vision statement for the comp plan. Um, the old date for the vision was 2020, which is just around the corner. And I think in all of this, we need to um, include um, definitions of what a historical preservation looks like, um, what it's going to look like in our zoning, um, and what and maybe start a new round of community discussions focused in places like Slingerland that can kind of gather the community input and put it back into the comprehensive plan and zoning. 
Thank you. The next question, I'll begin with you, Mr. Harder. Do you think the town's budget process works well, and what do you suggest to improve it? Currently, I don't know a great deal about the budget process, but as with all new incoming board members, it's a learning process, and I'm sure I could quickly learn the process. I would be a uh, watchdog over the process. I would review item by item all the expenditures for our town, and I would make sure that our tax dollars are spent wisely instead of frivolously. Mr. Coffey, please. Um, I do think our process works well, but like everything in life, we should always review it to see if there can be improvements made. We have an open process. We have a series of workshops where the public is, is invited to come and does participate. Uh, we should definitely uh, uh, continue that. Um, the, we, the, right now, we're under great um, fiscal management. Uh, we have what's called the fiscal stress test. We have the highest possible rating in New York State and we've consistently been under the tax cap. I think in order to prevent stress in the future, again, we need to, to work to bring in a variety of businesses, big and small, because right now I think compared to Colony and uh, Gilderland, which have large shopping centers, we rely too much on residential taxes. So we need to do more to, to take the burden off of uh, the residential property. Ms. Cunningham, please. I think we're doing a lot of things right. I think uh, we've been under the tax cap every year since it was implemented in 2012. Um, we're also the only community in the capital region doing multi-year planning, which I think is really smart, sound fiscal management. And these are things I think we should continue to do. Uh, in our 2018 budget, we have a capital plan that includes water and sewer upgrades, sidewalks, and pub public safety improvements, which I think are needed uh, infrastructure and, and improvements that we need to be thinking about long term. So these are things I would continue doing. Uh, as someone that's managed budgets before and raised money, I, I also think you can always take a look at budgets and create more efficiency and, and, and as technology comes into play, um, think about other areas where you can be efficient. Thank you. Mr. Foster, please. Um, so this is one of those areas where uh, I put aside politics, as I think we always should, and I'll give credit where credit's due. And I think that John Clarkson did a very good job uh, implementing it and continuing year in, year out to look at a multi-year approach, and, and I congratulate him for doing that. Um, I also think that, uh, generally speaking, we're, we're in a good financial position. Um, with that being said, and my girlfriend Caitlin can attest to this, every day I'm looking at the budget, my own personal one and, and hers, and <laughs> uh, just about every other budget I can look at. And I sit on the board of directors with the Ellesmere Fire Company. I know as I've got a fiduciary duty uh, to the membership there. And we always need to be looking critically on how we're spending our money. And to that end, I think we are running a very lean operation. Um, we're doing more with less. Uh, but at the same time, we're building out the services that we plan on providing, and that includes additional sidewalks and parks and all these great things. But we need to look down the road if we're going to have the money in the budget to continue to pay for those. Um, we are doing more with less staffing, and I think that those are going to be some of the real critical challenges for uh, if I'm fortunate enough to be on the board uh, to be working on in the future. Thank you. And the next question, I'll begin with you, Mr. Coffey. Uh, there has been much discussion about reacting to challenges facing the town, such as overdevelopment. But what positive and proactive improvements do you want to make? Um, as I indicated in my opening remarks, um, overdevelopment is the number one concern that we're hearing about. Um, I, we can't stop development. Any politician who says they're going to come in and just stop development, um, I don't think is being honest with you. We can, however, guide development. We can hold developers to a high standard. It's something I did on the zoning board and the planning board. We need to gather up information. We need to make sure that a developer is going to come in and put a project in. They can give back things like sidewalks and hold them to do that. Uh, we can certainly try to steer development to areas which have already been cleared rather than have developers clear cut. Um, property and trees. Um, and then um, we need to um, 
Uh, again, one of the things the comprehensive plan talks about is having a mixture of housing options. So we need apartments, we need senior facilities, we need uh, ranch houses uh, that seniors um, can live in, and we have that. But we have to also be, take a, uh, a broader view at the different projects that are going on, take a comprehensive view, and not just have each of these projects going on piecemeal. Thank you. Ms. Is Gunny? it possible to repeat the question? Yes. If I find it, here it is. <laughs> I'm thinking of other things, too. Okay. There has been much discussion about reacting to challenges facing the town, such as overdevelopment. But what positive and proactive improvements do you want to make? I read that as broader than just development, but I do think we have a great comprehensive plan. A lot of communities don't have one, so I would like to improve on that and use that, as I mentioned before. Um, I believe we have signed the Climate Smart Community Pledge, which is a uh, New York State system, um, but we haven't actually been certified, and that's based on that would build our energy efficiency, which I think is important uh, moving into the future. Uh, we used to have a committee um, called Sustainable Bethlehem that looked at energy e efficiency, and I think that's something we need to maybe bring back. I've had people tell me that. Um, and I think we need to continue uh, to find opportunities um, for landowners and options for landowners to preserve space. They are entirely um, able to do what they want with their land, but if we can provide economic incentives and even create a fund in the town to purchase land or purchase development rights, I think that would help in, in moving forward as well. Thank you. Mr. Foster, please. Uh, I would generally echo the sentiments expressed with respect to preser uh, preserving open space and, and making sure that we are uh, growing in a smart, smart uh, manner that reflects the, the will of the people of Bethlehem. Um, so let me build out on another point, though, that I think we can do more with and perhaps be a little bit more proactive in, um, and that's youth programs and reaching out to our young people. Uh, I'm fortunate enough uh, through the Ellesmere Fire Service and also previously uh, having been a volunteer with the Bethlehem Youth Courts program, um, seeing some uh, you know, connecting firsthand with the, our young people, whether they be 18, 19, and then we've also got a fire department explorer program where they're even younger than that uh, in their teenage years. And it's a great program because you get them in the firehouse and you give them discipline, you give them self-confidence. And I see young men and women really growing through that service. There are folks that don't have those opportunities and we see this growing heroin epidemic. Uh, and it's not just impacting upstate, it's across the country, but uh, we are seeing it right here in Bethlehem, whether we like it or not. Uh, I think we need to be more proactive about what we're providing, uh, not just through our parks and recreation departments, but getting a little bit more creative and reaching out in a first-hand way. Thank you. And Mr. Harder, please. I think we need at this point to have all of our boards that review building projects promote and enforce green and sustainable design and construction practices. We currently approve anything in any form, we don't really require the green and sustainable design and construction. Uh, contractors may not be totally familiar with those practices. Our town boards, zoning, planning, and town board should all be familiar with it and should have it done rather than just talk about it. Thank you. Now, I have another question that I'm not sure, so I have a feeling this may be part of what your town has already. Okay, starting with you, Ms. Cunningham, the question is, do you support the sanctuary site vote, and would you do it again if elected? So I'm sure you as a community understand that. Right? Okay. Yes. Thank uh, you. I spoke at the town board meeting uh, when they had that vote. I would support that vote. Uh, I believe that our police uh, department um, is doing the right thing by focusing on community policing rather than trying to do the job of the federal immigration services. Um, I think we want people to feel safe in this town, wh whoever they are. Um, we don't want people to be afraid to report a crime, which is essentially why 